Yeah. All right, I want to welcome everybody to the first of our lectures. Um, there are still a lot of seats, so um, uh, and we still have people coming in. So let's see, I think we're okay for seats right now, but um, if you don't mind if you're squeezing a little bit toward the center so we can leave some uh, seats at the edge for the people who, are, who get here a little bit later. We appreciate it. Okay, so welcome to, let's see, I can describe this in a variety of ways. This is uh, officially Moon Month in Tucson, July is. Uh, this is the Lunar and Planetary Laboratories Summer Science Saturday, which we've been doing for a number of years. And this is all part of Moon Fest, which is a Tucson wide um, summer event uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the landing of, of Apollo 11. My name is Tim Swivel. I'm the director of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, and so we are your hosts here. Uh, but I would all I would encourage you to uh, take advantage of some of the other things that we have going on uh, as a part of our Science Saturday uh, here in the Hyperspace Science Building. We have two more talks besides the one right now. We have a talk at noon um, by Jeff Andrews Hanna, who is a current uh, associate professor, talking about kind of where lunar science is now and where it's going. We have a talk at 1.30 by Bill Hartman, who is another person who was involved in the early days of Apollo. Um, we have, uh, I suspect you've seen some of the stuff outside, and we've got a variety of uh, pieces of memorabilia. We have some informative posters. We have a moon rock or two. Um, uh, we have exhibits from another a number of uh, organizations. We also have uh, in the regional planetary Im imaging facility, which is one floor up. We're talking about the uh, that facility, which is where uh, you know it started out with sort of collecting all of the images that you know, we could find for the moon. Um, has grown from there. We also have tours of our new nanoscale, nanoscale characterization, material characterization facility in the basin. But unfortunately, I believe those have all, uh, are all completely booked right now. Um, some other events around campus. There are three other uh, venues on campus where we have things going on right now at uh, Flandreau Science Center, next door, uh, also known as Planetariums. They have events for families, including planetarium shows. And one of the planetarium shows, one called Capcom Go, which is just running for the month of July at Special Collections at the University of Arizona Library, and kind of across the street. You can kind of follow the moon balloons uh, to get there. And incidentally, uh, the moon, such moon balloons did not exist six months ago, um, but we kind of poked around and managed to find a manufacturer. So I'm kind of proud of those. <laughs> um, the, uh, but in special collections, they have a variety of things. Um, special collections, well, they hold house things like rare books. So there's there are first editions of books by a couple of guys uh, named Galileo and Copernicus. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of memorabilia from Ian Whitaker, who worked at LPL for a long time. One of my favorite pieces of Ian Whitaker's memorabilia is actually outside here, which is um, a book autographed by the Apollo 12 astronauts, thanking him for finding the site that they landed at. Um, there is a globe from a project called the Rectified Lunar Atlas, the basic idea being to project an image of a flat image through, from a telescope onto a round globe and you walk around on the side and you can kind of take the portion out. Um, this is the first time it's ever been on public display, it was used a lot in the 60s, uh, so that's kind of my per personal uh, favorite. Uh, special collections, their moon exhibit will run uh, through December, today's grand opening. Also, there are tours of the mirror lab available. Elsewhere in town, there are programs at the Children's Museum for children, not surprisingly. Um, at the Loft, they are showing a movie for all mankind, and uh, uh, Professor Bill Boynton will be uh, there talking a little bit about some of his uh, Apollo experiences in the Desert Museum. We'll be having an event at 8 o'clock this evening with one of our graduate students, Man Stoddard, talking about the future of Apollo, of lunar exploration. And there are all these other um, events around town for, actually, for the next several months. Um, you can find them all at moonfest.arizona.edu. 
Um, but what you're here for right now is a uh, to learn something about what it was like from somebody who actually worked on the Apollo program. And that's going to be Bob Strong. Um, Bob started at uh, LPL in 1963, coming here from the Space Science Laboratory in Berkeley. Uh, spent a number of years here. He retired as a professor in the year 2000. Uh, has continued to be uh, active in research, lectures, and that sort of thing since then. He's studying impact craters uh, throughout the solar system. But today, what he's going to be talking about is his experience with the Apollo program. So please join me in welcoming Boston. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Well, uh, this is a great day. No question about it. I mean, I am thrilled to death about today. 50 years ago today was a major landmark, and I mean a major landmark in human history. For the first time, humans set foot on another celestial body. It's amazing. And you have to put this in perspective. 50, uh, uh, 66 years before that event, before that event, guess what happened? First, the Wright Brothers flight. Exactly. The Wright Brothers, 1903. If you had been born in 1900, you would have probably, maybe if you lived to be 70, uh, seen man step on the moon. And that was in, in uh, 1903, this was the birth of aviation. It's amazing. Now it has been 48 years since the last uh, landing on the moon. And uh, since then, we've been going around in circles. For the, uh, the space station, International Space Station. Now, I don't mean to be just you know, pessimistic. Uh, it doesn't mean we're not going back to the moon. I think definitely we will be going back to the moon. I think for sure, but uh, not soon. Well. Let's go on here. Okay, uh, these are unanswered questions before the advent of lunar missions. And uh, the, uh, the thing is, what was the origin of craters? And that seems kind of superfluous today. But in those days, there was a big argument whether these things were impact craters or whether they were volcanic. That's for sure. We did not really know. I mean, there was a lot. I thought there were impact, but uh, other people thought they may be volcanic. And uh, what is Mars material and how was it formed? We didn't know that either. What is the composition of Mars material? What is its age? We did not know that either. And we didn't know the composition of the highlands material and what its age was either. None of this was known. Of course, we know all that now. And uh, yes, you've always seen this. This is the, the beginning of the Apollo program, basically. This is John F. Kennedy. This is on May 25th, 1961. Now, during the early 60s, in fact, almost all of the 60s, um, we were in competition with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, before this, this his speech, the Soviet Union had launched uh, um, a satellite into orbit around the moon. Everybody was flabbergasted about that. And then they launched a, um, a man, Yuri Gagarin, in orbit around the moon. Okay? And that was it. And so we were far behind the Russians. And so here is John Kennedy. I believe that this nation 
commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. That's amazing. Now, I was at Berkeley at the time he made this statement, and I said, wait a minute, are you kidding? <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was wonderful if we could do that. Well, we had almost no experience in space at this time. This was in May of 61. President Getty made this announcement after two people had been in space. On April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union put Yuri Gagarin in Earth orbit for one hour and 48 minutes. And two weeks later, Alan Shepard completed a 15-minute suborbital flight. 15-minute suborbital flight. And that was it. Okay. Now later they put a woman in space. Too. They were the first ones to do that. But at the time of Kennedy's announcement, the combined experience of humans in space was only two hours and three minutes. And only 15 minutes of that was American experience. So we had a real task cut out for us, that's for sure. Now, during the pro the principal investigation certificate, the uh, uh, NASA had a, um, a, a lunar program, which was based on Apollo data and other Earth-based data and everything. And uh, that went on until uh, about, uh, oh, the end of the 70s, okay? You know, I was a principal investigator on that. And this is the first view of the Earth from the moon. People think, well, that was done by the astronauts. No, it's not. It was done by orbit. This is Lunar Orbiter 1 in 1966. And this is a picture of the Earth taken from the moon. Now, this is a, a very not good picture at all, but uh, we didn't see it. And uh, it didn't cause much of a stir. This is the one that caused a big stir. Okay, this, this picture changed our perception of Earth. And this was uh, Apollo 8, December 1968. And it is a beautiful picture. And it showed that we lived in a very delicate environment. Okay, with a very thin atmosphere and uh, the blue planet. And we do. That's another story. This is, uh, shows the location of Luna and American Surveyor and Apollo landing sites. And um, you can see here, I want to point out, here they are. So the ones in red are the Russian Luna flights. They were going to the moon. Okay? And, and these are soft landed on the moon. And then the yellow are Surveyor. That's our, our flights here, and there was one. Um, near Tycho in here. And then the green are all Apollo landing sites. This one here, Apollo 12 and Surveyor 3, uh, this one, uh, the, uh, Apollo 12 astronauts went to, to the Surveyor 3. And it was Ewan Whitaker who found that, where that was, okay? Deserves a lot of credit for that, that's for sure. But that's where we were. This is Apollo 11. It was near uh, Surveyor 5, but that was not the, the um, uh, uh, that was not the landing site at all. And I'll go into this. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what happened there, and I'll go into that a little later. I was a member of the Lunar Operations uh, Working Group for Apollo 11. And uh, there's some things people, the public doesn't know about, I'll tell you about them. Okay, uh, so here is the uh, uh, lunar excursion mo module that's called the LIM, and the descent stage, oops, the de descent stage is, um, is right here, this is the descent stage, and this is the ascent stage, okay? And this was called the Eagle, okay? Command module is called uh, Columbia. And this is it, a picture over here. This is a command module. Go through this very fast. And here is the service command module. This went to the moon, and uh, this got him to the moon, got him around there, and got him back home. And uh, here is the command module. It hooked up to the, uh, to the uh, limb. 
And also there was a lunar rover vehicle that was used on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. And this was really a boon to the, to the exploration of the moon from Apollo, because here they could drive distances. And the cumulative distance for these three missions, cumulative distance was 55 miles. So that's halfway to Phoenix. Now that's <laughs> where all it is. <laughs> that doesn't sound very far. <laughs> but this is the moon, and they have a prep collecting sample at distances away from the spacecraft. Apollo 11 didn't have this, of course. And they were all very close to the spacecraft. They spent a total of, um, I think it was uh, 21, 21 and a half hours on the, on the lunar, uh, on the moon, 21 and a half hours. And of that 21 and a half, an hour, uh, two and a half hours were exploring the moon. Going around. I'll go into this in more detail in a minute. Okay. And uh, the astronauts on the lunar surface, this is the, and there are 12 astronauts from Apollo 11 through 17 who walked on the moon, 12 of them. And only four of those 12 are still alive today. I mean, they were, they were you know, older than I was. So uh, most of them, well, like Aldrin, he's 88 years old. So it's Collins. Collins didn't walk on the moon, but anyway, there it is. And so the ones that are alive today are Buzz Aldrin from Apollo 11, Dave Scott, Apollo 14, Charlie Duke from Apollo 16, and then Harris, Harrison Smith, Jack Smith, which is Apollo 17. And this is the sample of terms. The six Apollo missions had landed on the moon. They returned 842 pounds of rocks, core samples, and regolith. Okay, and uh, today about 400 samples are dis distributed for research each year. Now, th these are small samples. You can see the size of those. There's one up on the, out there, maybe two. Anyway, there it is. Okay, the Apollo 11 astronauts. This is celebrating Apollo 11, so I'm going to spend more time on this than the other ones. But Neil Armstrong was. Uh, one okay he had a lot of experience um in space and uh he was born 1930 and died in 19 or er, 2012 and then edwin buzz aldrin is born in 1930 and michael collins also was born in 1930 they're still alive and uh neil armstrong is not unfortunately here they are armstrong on the left collins in the middle and Aldrin. So uh, Collins was the uh, commander and he was in the command module while uh, Armstrong and Aldrin went down to the surface. And here, they, this is the emblem, this is an eagle, and the eagle refers to the lamp, okay, the lunar module. Uh, uh, Columbia was the uh, command module. And then this is a Saturn V and Apollo 11 liftoff. Now this, this is the largest rocket ever made, and still is. It's bigger than anything we have today. And it was designed by Werner von Braun. Probably know that. Okay, he, he was working for the Nazis during World War II and designed the uh, V-2 rocket, which uh, unfortunately bombed uh, her was sent to London and England. But anyway, after the war, then uh, he joined us, we took him because, and his crew, which were way far ahead on rockets, way far ahead of anybody else, anybody else. And he did a wonderful job, he really did, of uh, building the, the uh, Saturn V. It's, a, it's amazing. There's a model of it out in the exhibit hall. Please take a look at it before you leave. And this is the Apollo 11 landing site, which is uh, right here. Okay, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin. And this is Mari Tranquilitatis, right in here. And uh, that's where they, they landed. I'll talk about this in a second. And here's uh, another, just another view. This is an Earth Day photograph. Apollo 11 in this region. 
And let's go. This, this is the landing site. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this because uh, this, there's a lot of misunderstanding about how they got down there. First of all, when they started landing the land, they came in and they were having problems with the computer. It was saturated, it was overdone, and they were coming in faster than they had planned. So they did not land on the original landing site that was picked for them. They did not. They kept going on and they started to come down to, for landing and here was this big crater. Okay, well big, it's about 200 meters in diameter and it's full of boulders all around it and they couldn't land there. It would have been tragedy. So uh, Armstrong, Armstrong kept going and going and going and they started running out of fuel. And I remember I was on the Lunar Operations Working Group for Apollo 11. Uh, we were at uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston in a room and in contact with Mission Control. So everything Mission Control saw and did, we could hear and, and see in the room we were in. And we were supposed to, to uh, look and see that the, that the uh, astronauts were, were doing science, taking science. Okay. When we came down, we looked at the site and everything, and we didn't know where the hell we were. No, we didn't. And we had to know where we were, exactly where we were picking up the rocks, the samples. We had to know that. And so you and I and the other people in the, in the room uh, had uh, television pictures of them coming in. We knew the trajectory, and uh, we knew where that um, that crater was. So we finally found it. It took us about an hour to find it. And we didn't finally find it. Right? And, uh, and that's uh, where the water is. In fact, this crater right here, I'll talk about that in a second. Here is uh, an image. This is a high resolution from the um, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter of the uh, landing site. And you can see the trail, all this dark area right in here, that's where the astronauts walked. You set up a camera, and these are sci uh, science uh, experiments right here. And then here is this crater, and you see the trail up there. We, we uh, told uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> mission control that we thought they should go up there and get some samples because we know those samples would come from uh, the Mari. Because if, if the craters were impact, which I think we all agreed they were then, the ejecta goes all over the place and they were pretty close to the highlands. So they got to turn up, pick up um, Highland Rock too. And remember, this is the first one. We didn't know the composition. So we had to have, you know, we had to know exactly where they picked up these rocks, which was the place. Okay, this is an Apollo uh, panorama. This was taken by Neil Armstrong. This is, uh, you saw the little dark band that went up to the crater. Well, uh, this is the crater right here. And they picked up some rocks in here to bring back. And there is the, the limb. And here's the Apollo flag. You've probably seen these. A lot of these pictures I'm sure you've seen. Uh, and uh, the next is the, uh, uh, here's a, an astronaut at the Instrument Bay right in here, giving out some experiments. And then here is the place in the seismometer right in here. And there's the flag and there's the camera you can see there. And then here's the Apollo 12 landed uh, surveyor three. Now I'm going to go through these other ones uh, fairly rapidly because I know you, there are other people here. <laughs> I told them to keep it down. <laughs> so I will. But anyway, this is where Apollo 12 landed. And this is the surveyor three landing site that you and Whitaker uh, found. Okay? He also found the uh, Apollo 11 landing site. So there's uh, 12, 
landing site. And this is uh, a diagram of their EVA, vehicular activity, right in here. Here's the pile of 12, the landing site. Here is the uh, surveyor, right in here, just in the of the surveyor. And uh, the next one it shows the, uh, the uh, walking around, okay, part of the EVA. This is the descent stage right in here. And this is the OSEP equipment right, right in here. OSEP. Apollo landing, Apollo lunar surface experiment package. There it is. <laughs> Got it. I remember. <laughs> That's pretty good. I remember that. I'm 85. I didn't remember any of this stuff. But anyway, there's a, there's a landing stage. And uh, the next is the shows the spacecraft. There's Apollo 3. Or right, so Surveyor 3 spacecraft right in here. This is Surveyor Crater. You can hardly see this crater but because it's very degraded. Okay? And then here is the intrepid descent stage right in through here. And then this is the uh, picture that I think uh, this is, I'm sorry. This is the Surveyor spacecraft and they were asked to pick up uh, the camera, take, take the camera off so they could bring it back and, uh, you know, see how it survived the lunar environment. In fact, this was very controversial because they found some bacteria on it. Oh, no. Yeah. And they said, wait, is that from the moon? Bacteria from the moon? It wasn't. It was contaminated on the Earth. But anyway, there it is. And there's an astronaut, in fact, he's starting to take the uh, camera off. And there's the space right through the limb. And then um, Apollo 13 failed. You probably all know that. That, that was a real tragedy. Um, it uh, failed to land on the moon. And that uh, oxygen tank on the service module exploded. And it caused a lot of very serious damage. It was really, really bad. And uh, I mean, we were all very tense. I, I didn't think they would make it back. And so what happened is the spacecraft continued on to the moon and on a trajectory that sent it back to Earth. In fact, they used the uh, third stage of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, rocket to do that. And then finally, they got back after a lot of hardships. They had to spend a lot of time in the limb because they were running out of oxygen. Okay. And they returned to Earth oops, uh, on April 17th, 1970, six days after the launch. It's too bad, but that did not land, that failed. And then Apollo 14, the landing site, here it is right down here, Apollo 14. And this was on the ejecta blanket from the Embryon impact, Embryon impact. And uh, they collected samples of the, uh, of the, of the impact. Here's three large craters, and uh, Mari Embryon is off the screen. The and then this is the uh, Apollo uh, Travelers map. Uh, these were all done by the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is that. In 2009, well after the Apollo mission, and uh, you can see where they walked around and collected the samples. Um, oh, this is the landing site. There's a descent stage. This is the LSAT, the experimental package, and then uh, this is the another high resolution showing the uh, descent stage. This is Antares, and this is a high resolution of it. And this is the LSAT. Experimental package, and this is the, this is the uh, the land. This is the spacecraft Apollo fourteen, and uh, then this is the a astronaut uh, Alan Shepard on Apollo fourteen, walking around. Now he's this he's the one that he's the first one American that went in didn't go into orbit, but the sub um, 
suborbital flight. He's the one that did that the first one. That's our first experience in space. That's Alan Shepard there. Next. Okay, here's uh, an astronaut taking a panorama. Uh, another one. This is a Apollo 15 landing site. You see here. This is the rim of uh, Embryum impact basin right here. And here is the uh, landing site. This is the rim. And this is the Hadley Grill, which is um, a lot of drainage channel. Okay, we know all about that. We, we didn't, you know, we still were, didn't know much about that. So uh, it was a lot of drainage channel. And this is another uh, view of it right here in higher resolution. Right through here. And this is the, uh, uh, an image from the pan camera in orbit. Okay, uh, Apollo uh, 15. And this is Apollo 15 landing site in the EVA. You can see here, there's the LSEP again. Each one of these things uh, from uh, 12 on had this LSEP uh, experiment package. And this is a lunar rover right in here, through here, the descent stage. Here's a picture of the astronauts at the drill site. The drill, a uh, sample from the subsurface. And this is Apollo 15 panorama of the landing site. You can see there. And uh, uh, this is part of the rim of the uh, uh, embryo. And here is uh, an astronaut and a uh, rover at the Hadley Rill. You can see right here. Big, huge thing. This is a lava drainage channel. And this is an astronaut going to the, uh, the rover. And uh, here we are for uh, Apollo landing site uh, from Earth, Apollo 16. This is the only one that landed in the highlands. The only one. Okay. Uh, Ewan Whitaker and I uh, debriefed or, or briefed the, uh, the Apollo 16 astronauts just before they, they took off. They were on a trajectory that was unique, and uh, they wondered what picture, what objects on the surface deserved high resolution. And so we we uh, briefed them on that. I'll show you some of that in a minute. And then here is another picture of Apollo 16 right here, the cart and everything. And here is one more right in here. Smoky Mountains and so forth. And then there is the uh, um, L-Rock image showing the traverse. Now they had a, this is a, some of this is off the frame, but here is a, the astronaut rim and the rover. You can see the rover here. And this is the uh, science experiments. Or one of them anyway, and uh, this is uh, on a last month on the EVA, and this is the rover. Now, as I said, we uh, briefed the, uh, the astronauts, and here's some uh, memorabilia. This was uh, the um, uh, uh, this was a pass for the Apollo 16 astronaut briefing, March 23rd, uh, 1972, and this was at the John F. Kennedy Space Center on uh, Cape Kennedy. That was named after Kennedy. He you know, was assassinated. Everything. The six, six, 60s were really kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. they were, they were, the Vietnam War, there were demonstrations right here on campus about the Vietnam War going out of there. And uh, Kennedy was assassinated in 63. Martin Luther King was assassinated. It was not a pleasant time. But anyway, there we are, uh, there's the past. This here is the commemorative uh, cover uh, postmarked in Houston, Texas on the day Apollo 11 landed. In other words, this was done 50 years ago today. You can see it right here, this is Houston, Texas, and there's the date, 20th, 1969. Uh, we, were, we were there. And this is the flag carried to the moon. Uh, that the astronaut uh, gave both you and an I. Uh, this was carried to the moon, and you can see the astronaut's signature right here. And uh, there it is. And then this is a, a little inscription that's to me. It says Bob Strom. I'll read it here. You can't read it well, but 
Bob Strong, many thanks for the effort you put into helping us get ready. So I'm very proud of this, this flag. I know that that's been to the moon, by <laughs> I haven't been to it. <laughs> well, anyway, this is the landing site of Apollo 17. I'm finishing up now. This is, uh, it landed in the Taurus Neutral Valley, which you can see right here. So, this is Mari Serenitatis and Nick Taurus. Um, uh, yeah, Sir the Tardis here, and um, <coughs> Mari Tranquil the Tardis is up in here. Let's see here. And so this was really a great mission. This was the last mission, and it's the only one who had a, a, a scientist on board, and that's Harrison Smith, Jack Smith, who, who's a geologist, went on that. They were on the surface for three days compared to. All oh, that which is one day. Okay. Or roughly yeah, less than one day. They were on three days and they did a lot of traveling. Here's another view. This is uh, from an Earth based picture, but you can see they're, they're right in here. And they got samples from these mountains, which is uh, probably ejecta from uh, Serena's Donald's. Well, here is the Apollo 17 landing site and the EVA. So this again is another picture from the Elva um, spacecraft. There's the uh, the uh, descent stage, the geophone, and the LSEP equipment, and so forth. This doesn't show the whole thing because they went a lot further. This is uh, one of the astronauts uh, with the lunar lander in the background and, uh, and the uh, Lamb. And then this is a, a rover, an astronaut rover on a, a fairly recent crater, a very large crater, a rim, large crater. And this is the astronaut rover and large sample uh, rock, this big thing. A little too large for you. Yeah, they couldn't, <laughs> but they did sample it. <laughs> they took a piece off of it and brought it back. And uh, the next lecture is going to tell you, you know, the, the science, uh, what we learned from that. I think that's what's going to do that. And what we didn't learn, or there are still questions. And here's an astronaut in the Earth. That's a really a beautiful shot. Here's a flag, astronaut. This is uh, Jack Schmidt. That's the Earth. And this is the Apollo missions that were canceled by President Nixon. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's supposed to be eight, there's supposed to be 20 missions. 18, 19, and 20 were canceled. And that was done before the uh, flight of uh, Apollo 17. Now, that you will never know how much that upset us, not just me, but everybody <laughs> associated with this program. It, uh, it blew our tops. And you can see here that one of these, as Leonov, a Russian, is going to fly on 20. It's a sign of peace. So anyway, um, at this point, uh, well, you know, before this, we thought, in fact, we were just sure, and when I say we, I'm not talking just about the scientists, I'm talking about NASA. We thought that we were, uh, we were totally convinced that the astronauts would be sent to Mars by the early 1980s. Yes, the plan at NASA was to, after these missions, we were going to go on to Mars, and we haven't yet. Uh, I'm not going to say it. Well, that, is, that isn't to say it's not going to be, because in fact, uh, NASA is again planning to land astronauts in the moon by about 2024. Maybe 2026 or something, but it's in that, in that ballpark. 
and eventually going to Mars. So I, I'm not being a pessimist. This is going to happen. I'm just very sorry that I'm not going to be able to see it. Well, unless I live to be 100. <laughs> no. But anyway, there it is. So the Apollo impact on lunar science was tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. The return samples determine the composition of the Mars, the highlands, the ages of the corner of salts, and many impact events, and a lot of other discoveries, which will be discussed uh, this afternoon. Yes. And uh, an example is the Embryon Impact Basin occurred 3.94 billion years ago. And this is from the Apollo 14 returned Embryon Ejector samples that they brought back. And they discovered zircons in there, and they can discover from those, I'll go into the radioactive decay, but anyway, that, uh, uh, that impact was 3.94 billion years. You like that, McEwen? <laughs> <laughs> and these data are helping us determine the geology evolution of the moon, which is going to be talked about. Well, that's all I have. I did. I did make it. <laughs> I did make it. I did make it. And uh, I guess I've got uh, some a couple of questions. Sure. Yes. like the scope like after, like early 1980s like mars like put a man on mars okay but then they didn't do that they went to the space shuttle so like what was the thought process there and then what would have been the point to put a man on mars versus like putting money into robotic playthings that can go to jupiter and you know everywhere else so i'm just like what's the the wide frame layout of what everybody politicians and scientists were thinking after 17. Mars is one of the most interesting planets in the solar system. You know, it's kind of Earth-like in a way. It's much smaller, but it did have oceans and ice sheets, for sure. On there. And there's a good possibility that uh, life may have developed. We don't know yet. They found organic compounds, but they're not necessarily uh, life. Right? They're all uh, they've also detected methane, on, uh, which could have been uh, biological. So there is a possibility that life may exist, or may have existed, you don't know, on Mars. So I think it's really important that we go back to Mars. That was one of the big uh, draws of you know, Mars. Is, and, uh, it's had a very interesting geologic history and so forth. So it's a very, very interesting planet. And the, space shuttle. the space shuttle. What was the point of, of doing that instead of going to Mars? I don't know. Yes, <laughs> I would have gone to Mars. I would have gone to Mars. The shuttle was, uh, of course, transport astronauts to the uh, space station, basically. And that stopped. I mean, uh, guess who's transporting them up there now? <laughs> Okay, is it true that the instruments, the seismic instruments that were left by Apollo were turned off in 1977 to save money? Oh, I don't know that. I don't know that. Is that true? Well, you mentioned a number of times that you know they brought up these um, they, they brought these experiments and that they spent a lot of their time on the surface of the moon doing these experiments. Um, um, I was wondering if you could just list a few things that they did so we can understand what well, these the are. Well, there's one. Uh, also, there was some to measure the uh, um, plasma from the sun, for instance, and uh, things like that. I don't know all of them. Uh, I really have to look that up. I know there were uh, quite a few instruments to do that. And of course, to bring back the samples. I think there is a seismometer still working. Maybe not all of them, but I know they detected um, moon quakes, for sure. And, and they, the, the only ones still working are the 
took some corner cube reflectors that you can bounce a laser off of to find out exactly how far the moon is. And those are still, you know, those still working. I mean, nothing can hold out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of the later landing sites look pretty marginal relative to the Apollo 11, like 11 landing sites uh, or sites. So, so were those? I guess those were intentional. Uh, can you talk about uh, what the maneuvering was like and whether they really did intend intend to land right where they ended up? Well, well on Apollo 11, they didn't. Right. Yeah. Explain that. And on the others, they did pretty much. And the, the landing sites were selected by. All uh, groups of scientists, uh, you know, including me. These, these are recommendations, and the main the main thing is not the landing boat, the safety of the astronauts. The safety of the astronauts. So these all had to be relatively close to the equator. Uh, I would have loved to have seen them go up to the poles, uh, but they couldn't do that, and they only had one to the highlands. So. So, um, so, and the other missions didn't have the test moments like the Apollo 11 mission had in terms of hitting right no, they wanted to hit? No, they, they did right on the spot. And I think that's because they learned a lot from Apollo 11. You know, there were some problems. Apollo 10 went to the moon, you know, and they tested the uh, limb on that, and that was a kind of a disaster. <laughs> It wasn't intended to land it, it was just intended to come down and come back up. But it started spinning around and they had uh, good problems and they tested out. So, and, and it improved. Each mission was better than the next. You know, we were efficient and traveled further, got more samples and everything. Yes. Okay, back there and then here. Yes, a Surveyor 3 camera that was brought back by the Apollo 12 astronauts. Uh, I never heard that Earth bacteria was, was found on that. Do you suppose that was viable or? Well, was there, was a, there was a big argument. About still that. is. Yeah. <laughs> still is? Yeah. Okay, still is. But, you know, I don't know. <laughs> there was viable bacteria. In the in the camera, the, the piece of camera that they brought back, there is still an argument over whether the viable bacteria had been on the surface of the moon for two years or was a contaminant. And be, literally, people are still arguing about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it's a, it's an important question. Oh, it is absolutely. And then there, and then there, and then there. In all the footage I've seen of the astronauts collecting samples, it seemed like a very uh, ineffective method of loading 800 pounds or, or even a portion of that, uh, little scoops, tiny scoops. What other tools or methods did they have to, to gather rocks? Uh, they, had a, they had a bore where, you, where they got some surface samples, and that went down several meters, or a couple of meters or so. And they got on the surface, which is a regolith, and then they picked up blocks. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was uh, you know relatively random until uh, seventeen when the geologists were. and so he used his knowledge of geology to make uh, selections of rocks. Basically. Yeah. Uh, what are the what are your thoughts on the work that's been in the private sector? What, um, what, the, the private sector, the commercial companies. Like well, I think they did a good job. There's no question about it. Uh, I mean, I mean, think about it. The when they went to the moon, or when they were building this stuff, the moon. Uh, did you have a computer in your desk? Hell no. I mean, when I came here, I had a, they. We had a computer in the, in the university, and we had these little punch cards. I'm not to take them over there and they've known the truth, but I didn't have a computer in the desk. Finally got one, but a criminal in hell. That was a technology. And I'm still amazed that we were able to do this <laughs> with the technology we have today. I mean the computers, this the cell phone that you have now is a million times more efficient than the computers they had on, on the call. I think the, the question was going forward, the, the private companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX, do you think? Oh, 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 
Oh, I don't know. I hope I hope they are. I mean, that's my big hope that they're going to do this. I, I think they have plans of going back to the moon and even Mars and setting up a base on, on Mars or at least in orbit around uh, the moon, a, a base that they can go down to and maybe even a base on Mars someday. I mean, we're talking about that, and I, I think it will happen. I'm not going to see it, unfortunately. Well, but, uh, the other day, you might have been on Mars in four years, so you never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Why did the landing sites have to be near the equator? Oh, because, uh, because um, that's the simplest way of getting to and from the moon is to go around the equator. Yeah, it, 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 it depended on the uh, capabilities of the spacecraft, the amount of uh, fuel they had, and so forth. So it was restricted to the uh, equator about 20 or 30 degrees north or south of the equator, something like that. Did it go to the poles now? What? Could we go to the poles now? Could we go to the poles now? I think so. I hope so. I was just wondering how the Apollo missions related to the broader science community. Did they make all of the data available? Did they share the samples? Or was it kind of tightly held by NASA and didn't really get shared? Before? No, they shared the samples. So it was very sure. open. Oh, yeah. Uh, the president sent samples to all the <laughs> As a state of every country in the world, practically. Uh, but you know, they're shared. You have to apply for them, of course. It's scarce. But you know, it was, uh, that's what they got the samples for to distribute the science. To do that. Okay, well, a couple, couple more questions. We're right here. What do you think about uh, Jeff Bezos, the O'Neill space colonies? And do you think we'll live you know, like that in a few hundred years? Space colony. The own, you know, the, have you seen Jeff Bezos' presentation? How we're going to be living in these O'Neill space colonies, and um, they have self, you know, rotating gravity, and they'll be like Maui, but like up in space. And um, you know, that's where that's and Earth will just be like zone for light industrial, and we'll have trillions of people living in space colonies. He, he gave a great presentation a couple. A month, two months ago. Well, I, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Um, maybe if it's feasible and they get something out of it, it's science and maybe even economics out of it. Smart. I mean, I'm all from space exploration. Last question. Yes, and you mentioned there was several seismometers on the moon surface and they were registry. And there were also were at the impact experiments. Yes. And one of those impacts caused a resonance that at that time could only be explained by a hollow moon. How did hollow it, moon? Yes, it, because it was resonating so much well, that yeah. that was the only resonance at the time. How did it, how was it explained afterwards? That I don't know. I, I, I do know one thing, the moon is hollow. <laughs> I, I think yeah. it had to do with the, this the near surface being uh, sort of this not quite compacted gravity sort of thing, so it just kept traveling through that. Okay. Okay. All right.